Hello there and welcome to this very special feature from Tidelines Book Festival. My name is Michael G. Malone and I'm on the planning committee of the festival. And today we are showcasing the, the strength and breadth of the talent that we have in this county. Um, we have invited a number of our top authors to read to you from their books, highlighting the location, the places and the people of Ayrshire. So, buckle up, sit back and enjoy while we take you on a journey. Thanks now. Hi there, my name's Gordon Brown. I'd like to thank Tidelines Festival for inviting me to say a few words and read from my books. As Gordon Brown, I'm also Morgan Cry. This is my latest book, 31 Bones, which is out just now. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about this book, Deepest Wounds. Deepest Wounds is partly set in Irvine. And what I'm going to do is read from the beginning of the book to start with. And then I'm going to read a chapter which is based right here in Ardeer Point. Chapter 1. There's a time to die and a time to live. It's my time to die. The rope around my neck is tight. Air is already at a premium. I'm drawing short breaths. Asphyxiation is not a good way to go. Lack of oxygen and the excess of CO2 demands that the body breathes. The rope draws taut around my throat, rough hemp, scraping skin as I twist my head. The fan above me beats out the rhythm of a failing heart. The blindfold I'm wearing lets no light in. My feet are numb. Up on my tiptoes, I sway. The rope keeps me vertical. My neck is taking strain every time I overbalance. My hands are tied behind my back. The room is cold. The winter outside has come inside. To add to the chill, the fan blows an iced wind on top of my head. The near door, nearby door is open. Let's freezing rain splash. My naked body shivers. A gust and the chair wobbles. My feet dance. My neck strains. The radio in the room tells me that for $199 down and nothing to pay for six months, I can own a new waterbed. I chew on the gag. The gasoline in my mouth is bitter. The gasoline on my body is leaking heat as it evaporates. The door to the outside cracks back on its hinges as more wind is funneled into the room. My toes, slick with fluid, slide on the chair. I brace my neck and pull myself upright. My throat is closing. I gag. I slip. I slide. Gain some purchase, but the rope is a little tighter. A slipknot. A choker. A howl from a beast outside echoes around the room, like a warning from Hades. Distant. I lift myself a quarter of an inch higher, enough to ease the thick necklace. I draw in air. Cold sustenance pours down my throat, my life measured in two half-filled lungs. Ill-inflated balloons, nothing more than crumpled plastic bags in my chest. I hold the air, maxing the oxygen exchange, sucking the last molecule. My ribs start to hurt, aching. The air inside me is heating up. My body wants to spit it out and drag in the fresh stuff. The primeval in my head is taking over. I exhale. Air sprays between my teeth. My toes fold and the rope grabs again. I search for anger, defiance, a last throw of the dice when the game is already over, but my vocal cords are neutered. A dribble of spit leaks between my lips and my feet slip again. The rope grips, my toes losing contact with the chair as my airway slams shut. Blind panic kicks in, I thrash around, my world lights up. Flashes of brilliance as rods and cones in my eyes fire. No last thoughts. No lifetime in a heartbeat. No last minute calm. Just sheer fear.
Now what I'll do is read a short extract when Craig arrives here in Ardeer Point. And the reason Craig here is, he's ex-military from America and he's a preternatural ability to bring out the worst in people and he's been chased by a black ops agency and he believes that there is a base in the old big idea. A teacher once told the class I was in that the less we knew, the happier we would be. I thought he was mad as a brush. Why in the hell would a teacher tell you that? And it's just plain wrong. I couldn't be more ignorant of what's going on at the moment, and I'm a country mile from being happy. But I need to go on. I need answers. They may not be the answers I want, but I need to know, and I need to know soon. Not knowing isn't always freedom. My head hurts when I try and place order in the world of what might be, what is, and what isn't. After I came back from Iraq the first time, a mental wreck, I buried myself in Charlie's bar in LA. Each night I would sit and work as much alcohol into my system as was possible. My barbell grew, but Charlie never called it in. A mixture of pity for me, love for my wife, and the fact that he'd spent time in the same institution I had, all mixed together, was worth an unlimited credit account. Life was simple back then. I would help around the house, prepare a meal for my wife, sit and watch TV, and then, when her eyes closed from the strain of teaching seven-year-olds, I would slip down to Charlie's bar and sit. At weekends, I would shop or I'd walk in the park or do a million other things and still be at the bar by nine o'clock. Lorraine never tried to stop me, not at first. She saw it as part of the recovery process. But I knew it was a dangerous way to screw up my life. When I got offered a job in the security in Iraq, I jumped at it. Lorraine wasn't so keen, but I needed to do something useful. The fact I screwed it up was just the first step in a journey that has led me to sitting in a car with three people I barely know in a country I've never visited, driving to a place that is linked to me by a single piece of paper. We bump along the road between strips of grass. I look up at the sea rolling into view. We've been on the road for the best part of an hour and I'm still working my way through how far south my life seems to have gone. Candice, the driver, pulls the car into a rough and ready parking lot all lumps and bumps and no discernible difference between it and the surrounding seafront. We vomit from the car, spewing out into the cold. On three sides of the lot, the sea is taking a crack at the coast. A beach stretches out to the distance, narrow with an artificial sea break less than 20 yards from the high water line. On top of the sea break is a ragged line of fencing topped with barbed wire. A couple of hundred yards along the sea break, there's a mural of a man's face. Candice catches me looking at it. Rabbi Burns, she says. That's who you're looking at. There was a plan to cover the entire wall with it, but the funding ran dry. It was behind the fence on top. That's the old dynamite plant. The nearest bit's still active and well protected, but further along, it's easy to get in. A high-pitched whine cuts through the air. A motorbike snaps into view. Throttle open, it dashes along the shore beneath the sea break. The driver keeps the wheels just out of the water as he winds up the speed. Candice looks on. That's what I do at the weekend. It's trickier than it looks. You don't want to go driving through the water. The salt is a killer. And if you hit a hole, you're mince. It's the first time I've really looked at Candice. She has short dark hairs and darker eyes and I also have no idea what mince is. Can you get past the fence on the top? Easily, she says. The first bit's solid, but further along, the old area's abandoned. If you climb up next to Rabi, there's a break in the fence that the bikers use to access the ground beyond. They love it in there. The old bunkers make a great place to fling bikes around. Bunkers, I say. Candice waves her arm. When it was a dynamite factory, they kept each building separate and built them as bunkers. That way if one exploded, the rest didn't follow. They're little more than empty shells now. How far along does the beach go? About a mile and a half. They built a visitor attraction called the Big Idea at the far end. It's what you're looking for. 
They bridged the river that cuts off the spit from the mainland. You used to be able to walk right into Irvine, but the bridge closed years ago. Lack of visitors to the big idea, it never really worked. But people used to call it something that you'll recommend. Huh? <laughs> Start again. About a mile and a half, they built a visitor attraction called the Big Idea at the far end and bridged the river that cuts off the spit from the mainland. You used to be able to walk right into Irvine, but the bridge closed years ago. Lack of visitors to the Big Idea. It never really worked. Some people called it something that you'll recognise. What's that? Some people called it the bad idea. Thanks very much for listening. My name's Gordon Brown and if you want to know more about me, you can find out at www.gordonjbrown.com. Thank you. From the Jewel Jean set off across the fields in the summer gloaming, slipping carefully out of the village that was quiet at this time of the evening. Several times she almost turned around and went home, but the thought of how upset he would be deterred her. She had agreed to meet him by an ancient thorn, a gnarled fairy tree that he had described, standing at the furthest point of the dry stain wall surrounding the old house called Nether Place. The estate, owned by William Campbell and his proud wife Lilius, was a large one and the woods were beautiful in summer. The turnpike road passed the front of the house with its massive old yew tree, but Jean slept round the back, well away from the house, and through the woods on the outer fringes of the park. This was a sheltered place, with light still slanting between the leaves and the branches alive with birdsong. He was waiting for her there. She saw him before he saw her. He was standing with his back to her, leaning sideways against the gnarled thorn. She saw his homespun blue coat and his unmistakable black hair, and her heart gave a lurch of excitement. His head was bent, and she wondered what he was looking at, and then she realised that he was reading. Of course, because he always carried a book in his pocket. In any free moments, he would be reading. Her friends despised him a little for that, but she admired it. It was one of the things that made him different, his defiant determination to find out everything he could about all kinds of things. He had once, in one of their conversations in the Whiteford Arms, remarked that ignorance was a curse, but it was more of a curse for the poor than it was for the rich, who could always buy ways to disguise their folly. She couldn't help but agree with him. Even her father, if he could have persuaded himself to talk to Rab, would have agreed with him. She had not thought about it before, but once he said it, it seemed self-evident. Knowledge was a blessing. The more you knew, the more you understood. And although it might be frustrating for a poor man to be a learned man, it was far better than ignorance. Rab, she said. He turned, slipped the book into his pocket and held out his arms to her. She took his hands and then he burled her round, just as if they were at the dancing again. But it was nothing like the dancing, because he pulled her close and kissed her full on the lips, as he had never done before. It came as a shock. His coat smelled of peat smoke, but there was oil of cloves on his breath. Not only did he kiss her hard on the lips, but all unexpectedly he thrust his tongue into her mouth. She drew back, frowning, rubbing her hands across her lips. 
and yet she couldn't say that she hadn't liked it, because there was something in her that had liked it very much. She was embarrassed that she liked it so much. It was all new, all surprising. He hugged her, running his hands up and down her back under her shawl, warm through the cotton of her gown, the light summer stays. But he didn't kiss her again. Ach, I'm sorry. You're that bonny. You shouldn't be that bonny. The cautious part of her, the sensible Mochlin girl, knew that she was no great beauty. She had a light heart and a light step a sweet voice and a sweet face. But she was no goddess to be a muse to poets. But then, maybe he was no great poet either. How could she tell? He fair fancied himself, as her father said often enough. But that was only self-love. Would his poems ever stand up to the scrutiny of the outside world? She didn't know. They said in the town that Rab was clever, too clever by half, too clever for his station in life. And what was he doing striking up a friendship with Gavin Hamilton and even with the Montgomery family? He should stick to his peers, the young men of the town, the drapers and ploughmen, the weavers and clockmakers. With an effort, she moved away from him, but when he took her hand, she didn't object. He threaded his fingers through her own and swung her arm as they walked. A pathway wound along the back wall of Nether Place, and they took it. Above them, oaks and elms reared their summer canopies. The long grasses beside the wall were threaded with the flowers of midsummer, a tangle of vetch, delicate wild roses clambering over shrubs and stones, ranging from deep to palest pink, brambles in bloom, there would be plenty of fruit later, and everywhere a froth of bishop weed. These pathways had been familiar to her from childhood, as they were to Rab, who had roamed these woods and fields, even when he lived at Loch Lee. They wandered around the back of Nether Place, and then headed slowly southwest, towards Bar Skimming, and the banks of the River Eyre that negotiated these woods and fields in a series of slow meanders. Not far from the river, he spread out his plaid against the evening damp, and they sat down together. The sun was very low in the sky now, but the light lingered as it always did at this magical time of the year. There was a breath of wind, a chill on the air that gave him an excuse, if any were needed, to slide his arm around her. Are you cold? No, no, I'm fine. He kissed her again, more gently this time. Maybe he thought he had been too forward. Maybe he was adept at gauging her response to him, any lass's response to him. They lay back on the rough wool side by side and then face to face. She'd never been so close to any man except her father and that only when she was a wee lass. Her breath mingled with his. He had unbuttoned his coat and she slipped her hand daringly inside, feeling the cool linen of his shirt, his ribs underneath, his heart beating fiercely in response to her touch. Time passed. If she could have slowed it down, she would, although they did no more than kiss, caress, talk of this and that, daft, inconsequential things, what Willie Fisher would think if he could see them now. She thought that there were two Mochlins. One was the Mochlin of the Kirk and Daddy Old and her father, a little dour and dismal but kindly enough, 
as long as you obeyed the rules. It was like one of her father's buildings, with each stone carefully fixed in place, a shelter to be sure, but quite possibly a chilly prison too. And then there was the other Mochlin, a place where young folk might wander through the woods and fields, a place of flower-scented days and nights, older, softer, enticing, a place at once perilous and inescapable. He kissed her again, bracing himself above her, saw the alarm in her face, grinned and suddenly got to his feet and pulled her up beside him. We have plenty of time. I'll not ask you to do anything you're not ready for. Do you hear me? Aye, I do. Do you trust me? Aye, I think I do. That's good then. And I'd best get you home. Your father will be fretting that the Sabbath is coming on and his wee you lamb not safe indoors. We're poets in the shape of wild beasts prowling around outside. Tommy Dawson made himself new to the world and ripe for the glories of that summer by showing he was unlike his father. It wasn't a matter to fight over. Some families are made up of strangers and nothing can change it. But I think it always bothered Tully that Woodbine couldn't cheer him on when he came by the football field to watch the game. The old man would only shake his head in a know-all way and stare at the Firth of Clyde with an injured look. Tully had named him after the cigarettes. They all had their nicknames, those reluctant fathers. They sat at home opening cans of lager and cursing our Saturday nights. I suppose we could have drifted over to the touchline and asked his opinion. But being young is a kind of warfare in which the great enemy is experience. Our cheeks burned and we watched him walk towards the unstained light of the harbour. 1984 was the end of Old Woodbine, or 1985, when the strike ended and the Ayrshire men returned one by one to the pits, met at the gates by women giving out carnations. The miners had fought hard, but they were, they were all sacked within a month. He takes his shame out on us. Tully said, I suppose Thatcher never really got it about the enemy within. And that comment was pure Tully. You could imagine how his whole spirit, as well as his famous good looks and his green eyes, came from a dream of freedom that existed just beyond his dad. But the photographs tell a sadder story. The saddest one. Because Woodbine had green eyes too. Irvine Newtown, East of Eternity. Tully was 20 years old in a lathe turner. He impersonated Arthur Seaton from Saturday night and Sunday morning by taunting his boss all week and drinking pints of black and tan all weekend. He looked like Albert Finney, all slicked up hair, but in Tully's case spiked with soap. At that time, he had the kind of looks that appeared to all sexes and all ages and his natural effrontery opened people up. He was in a band, obviously. They'd sprung into existence the previous winter. They were called The Bicycle Factory, another Saturday Night reference, and would later fill up with success and change their name several times as Tully went from singer to drummer. When people asked why he was so often the best man at weddings, it was clear they hadn't known Tully Dawson in his prime. He had innate charisma, a brilliant record collection, complete fearlessness in political argument, and he knew how to love you more than anybody else. Other guys were funny and brilliant and better at this or that, but Tully loved you. You had the leader thing when he was young, 
the guts of the classic front man. And if any of us got together, we instantly wanted to know where he was. Some people gain that status with power or with money, but Tully did it with pure cheek. His brighter language made older people seem dull. His dad wanted to constrain the future with robotic disappointment, drinking all day at the Twa Dugs, and Tully was ready for flight. He wasn't so much the butterfly as the air on which it travels, and that summer he was ready for an adventure beyond the Ayrshire hedges. So that's Mayflies by Andrew Hagen, yours truly. And now I'm going to read um, from the classic um, John Galt, a uh, previous urban novelist whose Annals of the Parish is coming up for a very significant uh, anniversary. It was published um, in 1721 and is a masterpiece not only of Scottish literature but of political novel writing the world over. I'm going to read you a wee bit from chapter 2, 1761. It was in this year that the great smuggling trade corrupted all the west coast, especially the laylands around the Troon and the Loans. The tea was going like the chaff, the brandy like well water, and the wastery of all things was terrible. There was nothing minded but the riding of cadgers by day and excisemen by night and battles between the smugglers and the king's men both by sea and land. There was a continual drunkenness and debauchery and at our session that was but on the lip of this whirlpool of iniquity had an awful time of it. I did all that was in the power of nature to keep my people from the contagion. I preached 16 times from the text, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. I visited and I exhorted, I warned and I prophesied I told them that, although the money came in like sclate stains, it would go now like the snow off the dike. But for all I could do, the evil got in among us, and we had no less than three contested bastard bairns upon our horns at one time, which was a thing never heard of in the parish of the Shire of Ayr since the Reformation. Troy the bairns, after no small sifting and searching, we got fathered at last, but the third, that was by Meg Glakes, and given to one Rab Rickerton, was utterly refused, though the fact was not denied, but he was a termagant fellow and snap at his fingers at the elders. The next day he listed in the Scots Greys, who were then quartered at air, and we never heard more of him, but thought he had been slain in battle to one of the parish about three years since went up to London to lift a legacy from a cousin that died among the Hindus. When he was walking about, seeing the curiosities and among others, Chelsea Hospital, he happened to speak to some of the invalids, who found out from his tongue that he was a Scotchman, and speaking to the invalids, one of them, a very old man, with a grey heed and a leg of timber, inquired what part of Scotland he was free. And then, when he mentioned my parish, the invalid gave a great shout and said he was from the same place himself. And who should this old man be but the very identical Rab Rickerton that was art and part in Meg Glegg's disowned bairn? Then they had a long converse together, and he came through many hardships, but had turned out a good soldier, and so, in his old days, was an indoor pensioner and very comfortable. And he said that he had, to be sure, spent his youth in the devil's service, in his manhood in the king's. But his old age was given to that of his maker, which I was blithe and thankful to hear. And he inquired about many a one in the parish, the blooming and the green of his time. But they were all dead and buried. And he had a contrite and penitent spirit and read his Bible every day, delighting most in the book of Joshua, the Chronicles, and the Kings. Before this year, the drinking of tea was little known in the parish, saving among a few of the heritors' houses on a Sabbath evening, but now it became very rife. 
Yet the commoner sort did not like to let it be known that they were taking the new luxury, especially the elderly women, who for that reason had their ploys in outhouses and by places, just as the witches' lang syne had their sinful possets and galrabitchens, and they made their tea for common in the pint stoop and drank it out of caps and luggies, for there were few among them that had cups and saucers. Well, do I remember one night in harvest in this very year, as I was taking my twilight donner beneath the hedge along the backside of Thomas Thorle's yard, meditating at the goodness of Providence, and looking at the sheaves of victual in the field, that I heard his wife and two, three other carlins with her bohea in the inside of the hedge, and no doubt but it had a lesson of the cognac, for they were all cracking like pen guns. But I gave them a sign by a loud host that Providence sees all, and it scaled the bike, for I heard them like guilty creatures, whispering and gathering up their truck pots and trenchers and cowering away him. Hello, my name is Michael J. Malone and I will be reading from my novel A Suitable Lie. This is the only one of my 12 books that are actually uh, based in Ayr, the, the town that I've lived in most of my life. Um, so what's that all about? Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to read a couple of excerpts, one from the start and one from near the back. Um, don't worry, it doesn't, there's no spoilers, um, but it's just the parts that sort of... Uh, show the town off a wee bit. I like to think so anyway. Um, so the book itself is about um, a young man called Andy who's suffered some tragedy in his life. He, his wife died and left him with a, with a wee boy and, he's, and the, as the book opens he just met someone else, someone that he's destined to, to fall in love with. Um, so they meet at an event, they're both feeling quite awkward so they, they agree to go for a wee walk and leave the place, and this is what happens next. Half an hour later, we were walking, walking alongside the low grey wall that holds the sands of Air Beach from being blown into the town. The tide was in, the waves had their lazy on, and we could see the sweep and curve of the bay ahead of us. And out to sea, holding up the skyline were the hills of Arran. A cool breeze was coming in off the water, and despite the early summer evening sunshine, I could see her arms stipple with the cold. Nice, she said. This is lovely. No wonder you've never left the town. How did you? It's written all over you, she smiled. Born, bred and buttered Ayrshire, eh? On the way down here, her chatter had been light and unaffected, and to my surprise, without any awkward silences. She was an easy lady to talk to. It's Anna, by the way, she said. She took a seat on the wall. I sat beside her. Just then, an elderly couple walked past with a yellow Labrador. Judging by the colour of its coat, it was just out of the sea, and it chose that moment to give itself a shake, spraying us both with, dro with droplets of seawater. Anna's laughter was loud and unrestrained. The couple were profuse in their apologies. The dog approached us and nudged Anna's hand with its nose. The woman tutted, This is Dave, by the way. Her pride in the dog evident. The wee greedy bugger's just looking for a treat. He's not the only one, the man said and gave me a wink. Geez, hen, you're all wet. I'm awfully sorry. No catch or death. Here, you can have my fleece. No, Anna stretched out the syllable. I'll be fine, honestly. The man offered her it again. It was clear he was momentarily caught up in the glamour of her. I glanced behind me at the sea and thought of mermaids and the siren call. Come on you, the woman said, giving him a nudge. Offering young women your fleece, they'll be calling the cops on you next. She set off, and with a regretful air, man and dog obediently trotted after her. Anna waited until the couple were out of earshot. At least the natives are friendly. As she said friendly, she looked into my eyes. Discomfited and flattered, I looked away. She was way out of my league. What the hell was she doing talking to me? 
We were getting round to introductions before Dave showered us, she said. The pause, a request for my name. I told her. Then what brings you to my hometown, I asked. I've been sent here for work. Well, what is it you do? Nothing special, she smiled. There was a light in her eyes and a blush to her lips. And I felt my thawing into back into the human race continue. I work for the bank, she said. But don't be asking for a loan, I'm just a teller. Wait, I sat up. Which bank? The one at the top of the high street. She cocked an eyebrow at my sudden interest. I mentally viewed the staff there. We were expecting a new team member, but that wasn't until next week. I don't start until Monday, she, she added. I've got a few days holiday to take first. She held her hands out, gesturing at the scenery. I thought I'd take the sights in first. A file had arrived on my desk the night before. The name came to me, Anna Reid. How do you know that? She straightened her back. Andy Boyd, I said. I'm your new boss. So the next scene, as I said, is near the end when things have gone awry, shall we say, <laughs> without giving too much away. Um, and and Andy's kind of looking for some peace, somewhere where he can go to make sense of everything. One by one I ticked off in my head all the places that normally offered the stillness that eased my spirit. In the days and weeks after Patricia died, I made for the wind and sand on Air Beach as if the energy there would scour the wounds from my heart. Other places helped, like River Dune and Craigie Woods. But now, I parted each of those places in turn sat in the car and studied the people around me as if they held some key, as if they had what I ached for, peace, stillness, an answer. They wore their happiness like a certainty, whereas the only thing I was sure of was that my life was an unholy mess. At the river air, on the cobblestone paving at the foot of the old brig, I saw a familiar figure. She was barely five feet tall, dressed in grey sweatpants and a red and white striped sweater. Her long grey hair was gathered at the nape of her neck and looked of the texture of a brillo pad. She was bent to the waist as if there was a broken hinge there. My son Pat called her the Swan Lady. She was an often seen figure down here. She would borrow a shopping cart from one of the supermarkets and ask them to fill it with stale bread. Once she judged she had enough, she would push the cart through the town, taking the bread to feed the swans that lived under the bridge. Her progress through the streets was as stately as a mad queen's, no doubt hampered by the fact that she couldn't straighten her back. There was an eccentricity about her that warmed me, that gave me hope. What I would be able to give to switch off from everything and be guided by the notion that all I needed to do was gather the loaves and feed the birds. Thank you. Away with the penguins by Hazel Pryor. The wind cuts through me. It is that damp, feral variety of wind one only finds in Scotland. I huddle in my coat and pick my way northward along the coast path. I've always believed in the efficacy of a day's walk and I refuse to be put off by the inclement weather. To my left, the sea churns in slate grey patterns and spits a wide, white froth out into the air. My stick steadies me over the uneven turf and sand. I've brought my fuchsia gold trimmed handbag, which is floundering tirelessly against my thigh. I should have left it on the hook in the hall, but one never knows when one might require a handkerchief or a painkiller. I've also brought my litter picking tongs and a small refuse sack. It's a lifelong habit of mine to pick up litter because of something my dear father once said. It's a small act of remembrance, as well as a token gesture to atone for the chaos caused by the human race. Even the rugged pathways of the Ayrshire coast have been sullied by the carelessness of mankind. It's no easy task wielding stick, tongs, sack and a handbag, especially in this wind. My bones are beginning to complain at the effort of it all. I work out a way of angling my weight to lean into each gust 
so that it supports me instead of fighting me. A gull screeches and dips through the clouds. I pause for a moment to admire the beauty of the tempestuous seascape. I have a particular liking for rocks, waves and wilderness. But something scarlet is bobbing up and down on the billows. Is it a crisp packet? Or a biscuit wrapper? My younger self would scurry down to the beach, wade straight in and get it. But now, alas, I'm incapable of such things. The spray blows into my face and drips down it with tears. People who litter the countryside should be shot. I push back against the wind and battle my way homeward. I'm flagging slightly by the time I reach the front gates. The Ballahays boasts a substantial driveway and is surrounded by three acres of pleasant ground. Most of the garden is walled, which is one of the reasons I like the place so much. Within these walls are cedars, rockeries, a fountain, various statues and four herbaceous borders. They are tended by Mr Perkins, my gardener. I glance up at the house as I approach, an ivy-clad late Jacobean style creation. The Ballahays is constructed from mellow brick and stone. With its 12 bedrooms and several creaking oak staircases, it's admittedly not the ideal home for me. Trying to keep up with its needs is a considerable task. It suffers from crumbling plaster and terrible drafts, and there are mice on the roof. I purchased it back in 1956, simply because I could. I flick the switch. The fake flames leap up in an instant orange blaze. Next, I turn on the television for Earth Matters, my favourite programme, only to discover they've replaced it with a documentary about penguins. Come to think of it, I do recall having seen something similar recently. It will provide a welcome break from the pernicious thoughts that have been in my company all day. This week, we're looking at king penguins. I confess. I am rather charmed by these singularly courageous yet waddlesome creatures. When the camera shows one of them losing its egg, which rolls into a steep, inaccessible gully, I observe how the poor bird grieves, beak pointing in the sky in despair. It really is quite moving. Robert Saddlebow talks passionately of the penguins' massive population decline in recent years. It appears to be due to environmental factors but more research is needed. I hate to think that these noble and attractive birds might vanish from the planet. My father's words come back to me. Words he spoke when I was sitting on his knee as a child, then on many occasions as I was growing up. I can almost hear them now, spoken in his earnest, gentle voice. There are three people in the world, Very. He called me Very. There are those who make the world worse, those who make no difference and those who make the world better. Be one who makes the world better if you can. I've met few people in my life who fall into the third category. I myself have done little in the way of bettering. I have chosen to interpret the three categories as people who throw litter into the countryside, people who ignore litter and people who pick up other people's litter. I have satisfied my conscience by means of tongs and refuse sacks. Beyond that, I cannot see that my life has been useful in the least. I finish my cup of tea and leaf through the gardening catalogue. I do little gardening myself these days, except for pruning the roses, but I do occasionally order a set of bedding plants or a shrub. I have some specimen rhododendrons at the Ballahays, of which I am particularly proud. Bright blooms help one along in life. I'm convinced of it. Besides, Mr Perkins, the gardener, who's been with me for 26 years and is beginning to look a little mouldy, needs a few projects to keep him interested. I put on my coat and gloves and wander out. I breathe in the clean, sparse Scottish air. I'm still feeling polluted after my visit to Patrick's disgusting abode. Terry's Penguin Blog, 6th December 2012. Penguins travel in many different ways. Most people think of a penguin upright and waddling, and that is how they'll sometimes get about when on land. Their tough feet have a kind of natural cramp on, which helps them move over snowy and snowy terrains. But they're not stupid. 
and they also know how to exploit the slippiness of the ice. Often, they'll flop down on their bellies and toboggan along at high speed. Tobogganing penguins always make me smile. I snapped this one while I was at the colony this afternoon. You'll see how the flippers are tucked into its sides and the feet stick out behind, propelling it forwards with the occasional push. The laws of physics do the rest. Of course, much of a penguin's life is spent at sea, perfectly streamlined. These guys dive in and out of the waves with flawless time, flippers acting as a combination of fin and wing. Under the water, they are real masters of movement. They swoop and soar, perform incredible acrobatics. They can stay underwater for 15 minutes without a breath, then they'll shoot out from the surface into a great arc like a dolphin. Sometimes they grab a breath before the next underwater sortie, or sometimes they'll carry on porpoising in and out of the waves. It's a magnificent sight. It really does look like an act of pure joy. Perry's Penguin Blog, 18th December 2012. Adelaide penguins are endlessly curious and endlessly busy. Today, Veronica and I were followed around by one particularly inquisitive character as we were marking out nests. Not yet of an age to have his own family, his interest seems to have been piqued by our activities. Here is a photo of him and Veronica watching each other. As you can see, she's holding her handbag well out of his reach. Elsewhere, nature is taking its course. Couples are copulating, eggs are being laid, and the first chicks are emerging. What a riotous community we have here on Locket Island. Thirteen seasons have passed, but I walk into this dilapidated place known, known to everyone as the barn, like I was returning to it after a disappointing two weeks summer break. I'm anxious, sweating, not about the job, about the interview, the kind of social situation I dread. I wander down the narrow corridor, it hasn't seen fresh paint since Higgy volunteered to decorate three months before I left. The carpets are new, strangely enough, loud and headache inducing, admittedly, but new. I pass the office, a large cupboard rammed with everything from cleaners, mops, detergent supplies and cans of petrol to last season's team straps. Balls and training equipment, it smells like something has crawled in there and died months ago. The changing rooms are exactly as I remember them, cold, dark, windowless and stinking of a mix of stale body odour and ramjet spray. The showers drip, the urinal trough is dented in the middle, leaving a puddle at the opposite end from the drain. And the light switch has gone on strike. I make a mental note to swap the home and away dressing rooms for next season. There's not much to choose between them, but I'd rather we benefited from a working radiator when the winter hits. The season we got to the League Cup final, a small army of volunteers materialised. The facilities were transformed. It's amazing what a wee bit of spit and polish and elbow grease can achieve, they'd say proudly. A selfless backroom team galvanised by the unfettered joy of an unexpected cup run. Failure, on the other hand, is like a rot that sets into everything and everyone. A blanket of gloom descending on a whole community of desperate men, for this is a corner of community life that is almost exclusively male. A pervading depression descends. There's too much invested, too little self-control on the sidelines when that investment bears nothing. Fans arguing and fighting amongst themselves, as if the village didn't have enough to contend with. The committee room is the biggest space in the small rectangular complex. As soon as the door opens, fresh shaking vac wafts up my nostrils, as powerful as smelling salts. An electric heater makes the room feel like the Amazon. The panel of four face me. None were here when I played for the club. 
to the right is the window onto the pitch. It's cracked, brown tape runs along the fissure on the inside. To the left are the wooden wall panels decorated with the names of captains and players of the year going back to the dawn of the 20th century. Two young Barshaw sons who didn't return from a war are also commemorated. Alongside them is Bill Shankly, who briefly played here. Further along is mine, the club's last great young hope, who abandoned it on the eve of their only cup final appearance of recent times. I'm surprised it hasn't been chiselled out, like one from an earlier era seems to have been. They know me, but I only know one of them. A ball yet not kicked in anger and I see defeat in their faces, sense the heavy gloom that is polluting the air. They are going through the motions, no one will touch this job. They know I know this, but still there's the formality to undergo. Rules are rules. William Kidd is the chairman. He took over early last season. He's new to the area. He doesn't have the deep roots of the others, but he has money. And that's more important. He runs a small carpet fitting business called Kids Carpets. They run regular adverts on local radio station with the ridiculous tagline, Piles Better. The logo is everywhere around the ground and on the club's red strips. I ask Higgy how much money Kid has put in. He didn't know the song, but he feels the need to reaffirm just how hard Kid's small team have worked to raise money for the club over the last year. Higgy vouches for the chairman like he was a mob boss's conciliary. But it's the depth of Billy the Kid's pockets that I'm primarily interested in, not the benevolence of his character. Other second division clubs like Muirkirk, Ardeer, Troon or Craigmark can muster finances to change the squad. Barshaw has a tiny fraction of that to work with. We'll be relying on gate money if we can attract a crowd. An intermittent sponsorship from the King's Arms. And the tireless fundraising of its committee members, main and sub. The only other route is favours. But reciprocity is in short supply here, just like everything else. Mr Garvey, hello. All right if we call you Daniel. Billy the Kid is a bald ball of meat and whiskey, as wide as he is tall. Danny, I reply. Ah yes, Danny, says the chairman. He probably thinks I should have grown out of Danny by now, become something more adult. Daniel, en route to the middle-aged era of Dan. We'll take some notes if that's okay. Mr. Kidd jerks his head sharply to one side and I follow its direction towards the corner. One of the seated men opens a notepad. Behind him, a young woman stands so close to a curtain that at first I think it's what she's wearing. She has long, dark hair. It almost reaches the clipboard she's holding. The committee introduced themselves as they came in, but no one refers to her. I hear you were quite a prospect when you last pulled on the ship, eh? It's a stupid icebreaker on anybody's terms. He sounds like a disappointed headmaster, about to admonish a former star pupil. It draws my gaze back from the corner of the room. I don't answer. The past is a foreign country and all that box. So, Danny, why do you want this job? I resist the urge to tell him that I don't. That my reasons for coming back here are nothing to do with the club. That it's simply a convenient staging post in the journey out of the dark place that I'm stuck in. I think I know how to win, I say, generalising. The committee react like it was a Gettysburg address. Nods and smiles. The woman writes, job done for them. Billy the kid gets up and goes to the cabinet. He opens a door and brings out a decanter. He pours a whisky for each of his colleagues. They are celebrating after one answered question. Well, that's our number one priority, son, says Phil Dick, the only one here that I remember. Phil's wife, Senga, was my primary southern teacher. She was, as you might expect, known as Sukma. Scrubbing this off the red brick toilet walls became a full-time job for the janitors. A letter was once given out to every child outlining that Mrs Dick was reverting to her maiden name of Brown. It didn't help. Sukma Brown was arguably funnier. I briefly consider asking if she's still teaching, but I don't. 442 or 433? 
posing as Bert Thompson, club secretary, as if we're holed up in a bank vault and he's whispering combination alternatives. I see the numbers written on his notepad. His pen is now poised, ready to record my response. Don't know. I'll need to assess the players, see how adaptable they are. Good man, he says, winking at the chairman, as one rehearsed question has been addressed. The chairman offers me a plastic cup, but I decline. Higgy's been keeping an eye on your progress with our growth kids. I glance over at the corner. The woman is staring out the window, probably watching Higgy pacing the touchline. Yuri's recommendation, I'm sure you'll gather. Aye, I say, to fill the gap, he leaves. We had a couple of options, says the chairman. I don't believe him. Higgy would have told me. Gil Hooley, last season's captain, was sounded out, but he told Phil Dick that he'd rather get a shot back inside off a combine harvester. You've made a few waves up there. The Press and Journal feature. We thought we'd best get in, quick, before Man United come calling. They laugh, not at me, and not in the condescending way this sounds. I think Fergie's probably pretty safe, I say, smiling. They are delighted at this because it opens the door to the real reason why I'm being interviewed for a single candidate post. What's he like then, Big Alec? Asks Treasurer Des Bryson on behalf of the males present, the beaming expectant faces. Best not to let them down. I conceal the truth and appropriate an apocryphal story that they'll recount at dinner parties for years. He came to the house back in 83, right after the Talbot semi-final, I tell them. They're preparing for the Cup Winners Cup final. And he still finds time to drive all the way to Barshaw to persuade a 16-year-old to sign for his club. This staggers them. And it would have staggered me too, had it been the truth. He told me I'd be nurtured at the Dons. Looked after and developed properly. He said I'd be a future Scotland captain under his direction, I tell them. When he said that, I knew it was the club for me. Aberdeen was the option available to me that put the most distance between me and the consequences of what happened on the night of the Talbot game. Alec Ferguson didn't come personally to pluck me from teenage obscurity. That's the truth, but that's not the tale I'm telling them. What a fella, says the chairman. Their faces ooze admiration at the class of the man whose picture I'm painting. The cut of him, the exquisite taste of him. I'm certain Billy the Kid will be contemplating the possibility of me persuading my old boss to revisit Barshaw, hand out a commemorative medal or two, record a line praising the luxurious comfort of a kid carpet, uttering the words, piles better. Oh Christ son, that's brilliant. Phil Dick slaps his thighs when I lie about Alec Ferguson driving me personally to a broth. Ten years ago, one of his last acts before taking over at Old Trafford. I'm not the man they think I am. And there we have it, our Tidelines, Book Festivals and Love Ayrshire feature. Um, we hope you enjoyed watching and listening as much as we enjoyed putting that all together. Um, so a massive thank you to all of our authors, Andrew O'Hagan, Catherine Tchaikowska, David F. Ross, G.J. Brown and Hazel Clare. And on behalf of Tidelines, I'd also like to thank James McLaughlin. Um, James is the, the techie guy that put all that together. Techie guy, that's his official title, I believe. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Melanie Nolan and Janice Weir, the, the co-chairs, along with the organising committee. Tidelines Book Festival is run entirely by volunteers and it takes a huge amount of work throughout the year to put it all together. So thank you to all the gang. Also, special mention for Morvin and Big for their social media prowess and to Waterstones for their support with the Graham McCray Burnett um, event. And lastly, to you, dear reader. Without you, we're, we're nothing. Um, so thank you for your continued attention and support and we look forward to seeing you all again in the future. 
at the Tideline's Book Festival event. Cheerio the new! Thank you.